Davis, I will not be the last. What do we think of when we think of leader? We think of someone who is brilliant, intelligent, compassionate. That can be anyone. That doesn't necessarily have to be situated within a male's body. The Me Too movement and the Time's Up movement have really been at the forefront of uncovering and exposing the biases and inequalities that women have experienced. It was a seminal moment for women. We saw people pay the ultimate price in ways that we think we've never seen before. Now, for us, it's what's next. 41 of the Fortune 500 companies are headed by women. We need to do better. 2020 in particular has seen women being pushed back into these gender roles, right? When my husband and I talked about the decision of someone having to leave, it just was not a question of who that person would be. It was naturally that it would be me because of the role that I play in our family dynamic. In a single year, we wiped out three to four decades worth of progress on women coming into the workforce and being able to make a living for themselves and their families. And so women have a different road ahead of them, no matter how good they are. It's just societal norms and human nature. Luminary is an inclusive membership, growth and career accelerator, as well as a collaboration hub. For women, but we do not exclude men. Thank you. After a, almost a 20 year career in corporate and investment banking, rising the corporate ladder, I decided to throw that all away and become an entrepreneur launching Luminary and self-funded it to boot. Our mission is to advance all women in the workforce, regardless of their professional journey. I think probably the first half of my career, it was just about doing well and doing better and being super competitive with my peers, which were mainly men, because I wanted to have that leg up. I wanted to, to be better. And, and I wanted to be better because I wanted to aspire to be a leader. I aspired to be a manager. As I sort of hit that second half of my career, that's when I realized that that womanness was at a disadvantage for me. I just knew that I had to compete. I was a competitor naturally. I was an athlete growing up. I had two brothers. And so that natural spirit was there, but it definitely hit you when you were looked at a little bit differently, right? What you wore, how you acted, but the labels that were put on you. You're emotional, you're aggressive, uh, you're harsh, you're cold. I never, as a manager, gave any of that type of feedback to men, so why was I getting that? I think there were multiple times where I felt like others were being promoted when I wasn't, mainly because of those labels, and I just wouldn't stand for it. I was always the dissenter. Like, how can you say that to me? Like, what do you mean? Don't just give me a label. Explain what that means, and um, a lot of times that bit me in the behind. <laughs> Women are not perceived as capable in the ways that we have historically seen men, right? And that's because of the patriarchy, right? The way that power um, plays out to strategically create uh, resource and access for men, driven by men, led by men. Women who are oftentimes seen as strong, and they're aggressive, right? Black women in particular, if you're strong, you're, you're angry, right? Gender stereotypes do really play a negative role in how women are able to access opportunity. So there are, are lots of reasons why women have not reached the heights in corporate America. This is after decades of talking about it and working on it and having pipeline programs and mentoring programs and ERGs. So one of the problems is 
Um, clearly, the tactics that we have been using have been insufficient, but it also means changing our culture, you know, changing how we think about women's leadership, changing about how we invest in our young women and in giving them the courage and the aspirations and the inspiration to dream bigger for themselves and to fight through the daily indignities to realize that bigger dream. We're raising our hands in our companies and saying, give me more responsibility, help me move up. And the reality is for most women, this excuse they get when they sit in that room with their boss is you're just not ready yet. You don't have all of these. Okay, so teach me. Most companies don't have the budgets to do that for every single employee. So why can't I do that? And supplement what companies are doing around learning and leadership development. When I leased the space and built Luminary here in New York, I have a great landlord and said, there's this empty roof up there. Um, what do you think about a rooftop lounge? And I said, great, it's gotta be called the glass ceiling because it's an extension of Luminary and we wanna break through the glass ceiling. When you look at the Fortune 500, when you look at women of color, there's still so few in leadership roles. And so for us, this idea of the glass ceiling just represents who we are as a company, who we are as a community, and that we're all in this together collectively. We are literally here to break the glass ceiling. I raise a glass to the community because we don't exist without all of you. My full name is Madhumita Malik, and it means sweet friend. And my name has been a source of pride and joy, and it's also been a source of embarrassment and anxiety for me throughout my life. I entered corporate America with Madhumita Malik, and I had a boss at the time who did not want to learn how to pronounce Madhumita, which was fine. He also didn't want to call me Mita, which was an option I had given him. And he decided to nickname me Muhammad. And so he would say, Muhammad, are we ready for the four o'clock call? Muhammad, are you ready for delivering the sales samples tomorrow? Muhammad, are you ready for lunch? And that happened both privately and publicly. And I share that story because it's important to share, but it's painful to think that I responded to a name that was not my own for many months until I finally left that company. Marginalized groups are having to pay an inclusion tax in an effort to mitigate the impact of racial and gender aggressions that they're experiencing, right? And they're doing this in order to be included in white spaces in particular, um, but also to resist Right, or conform to um, white norm, normative standards in these, in these spaces. So I think that when we're, when we're looking at the experiences of women of color in, in organizations, in corporate organizations in particular, we have to understand that they are having to deal with so many different um, obstacles that are creating, really creating um, barriers to their ability to gain access. I have left jobs due to excessive bullying. Those experiences range from everything to being yelled at, to being screamed at, gaslighting. I've been told by a leader that no one else will ever want you to work for them in this company. I gave you a shot. I have had the, my work product questioned, the integrity of my work questioned, and I've had my job threatened. I don't have enough fingers to count on the number of my hands on how many times credit has been taken or stolen from me. I'm sure many uh, women of color can relate to. You put in the work and you have great ideas and solutions and you're ultimately not the one who presents or gets credit for it. There is a 2019 study that showed that 40% of managers are women and of that 40% women of color only made up between 2.5 and 4.3%. The numbers really speak volumes about the experiences of women of color in corporate organizations. Women of color sit at 
the painful intersection, you know, as Kimberly Crenshaw has named it, of, uh, of, of race and gender discrimination. And so they live with both of those forces coming at them. What's sometimes hard for women of color is they don't not only sit at that intersection, they get lost in the intersection. Because, you know, when, even as companies are getting better about, for example, counting and looking at their diversity data, when you start to ask, all right, how many black women do we have? I know up in our C-suite, the numbers fall off the map. I mean, I think in the Fortune 500 right now, there's two black women CEOs. A year ago, there were zero, right? So I guess we should be excited that we now have two, or maybe it's three. It's 2021. That's three out of 500. Sponsorship is key. I am over mentored and I am under sponsored. I don't need any more mentors. And I mean that in the most loving way. I have so many mentors who have really been critical in my career and life, but a mentor is not going to help me advance my career. And Sylvia N. Hewlett talks about this in the Harvard Business Review book called Sponsor Effect, where a sponsor is somebody who's in my organization. They're typically two levels ahead of me, above me. And this individual will use their political capital, their social capital. They will have skin in the game and they will help me advance my career. And so that is what needs to happen more is that we need more women of color to be sponsored so that they can get into the C-suite and boardrooms. I remember very clearly going to see Michelle Obama on her book tour, Becoming, and she talks about microaggressions as being the everyday paper cuts, the everyday assaults that women of color face. And over a lifetime, the accumulation can have a devastating impact on your sense of uh, self-confidence and worth. Having people that I can talk through about the things that are going on in my career have been incredibly important. Um, having a really strong network of family and friends and other women of color who empathize and understand the experiences I'm going through. And I think there's nothing like children to help keep you grounded and realize what's important in life. A new report says women make up one of the fastest growing groups of entrepreneurs and employers. They include Sarah Blakely of Spanx. The tagline should be, don't leave home without it. The woman who started the shapewear revolution. And Allie Webb, who is well on her way to following in Sarah's footsteps. Unlike the kind of ambitious woman in a book like Lean In by Sheryl Sandberg, who's trying to work her way up the corporate career ladder, a girl boss is someone who says, I'm not working my way up the ladder, like I'm gonna start my own thing. Some of the most notable girl bosses are Mickey Agrawal, who is the founder and self-proclaimed CEO of Thinks Period Underwear. Emily Weiss, the founder of Glossier, which is a beauty brand. Audrey Gelman and Lauren Kassan were co-founders of The Wing. Welcome to No Man's Land. This is The Wing, a social and co-working space for women only. And so they were trying to be exclusive, but they were held to account for not being inclusive enough. And that kind of escalated and exploded in this expose in the New York Times by Amanda Hess. There were allegations from hourly wage employees at The Wing, particularly women of color, who felt they were treated like the help. A lot of the membership, it appears to be, were upper middle class white women. But if you went on the Wings website, the photographs were very diverse. So if you went on the website, you might think 90% of the Wing was women of color and trans women. I started working at the Wing as a design director in September 2019. When I started, the people felt kind of distant, pretty inaccessible. I struggled fitting in or feeling like I, I had any kind of real support or welcoming from the team. I was very excited because it was such a large design team. There were so many women, they're all very talented, and I expected there to be a little more camaraderie, but it just felt highly like um, everybody kind of looking out for their own interests a little bit. I actually remember an interaction with one of the designers. She was one of the junior designers. Saying very bluntly like, well, you have to earn that space with us. 
My impression of the two founders was that they were very glamorous women. They were beautiful and confident and well-spoken. They presented really well. I think that they wanted to present themselves as accessible, as like one of us kind of, but it, it wasn't that way. What I think about the leadership at The Wing is ultimately their primary focus was growth, was making sure the venture capitalists who are keeping this moving were happy. I think leadership was phony. I think they presented this mission that they think sounded really good and they had no right to lay claim to. I think the girl boss is individualistic. I think she is out for herself. I think she is highly ambitious um, to a fault. There was a big expose of Steph Corey of Away Luggage about what a nightmare of a boss she was to work for. She micromanaged her employees. She didn't allow private emails. Everything had to be in Slack, so it was in public. But if you look at Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos, it's very similar work culture at Amazon or at Tesla. There's extremely high expectations, but the way these men are written about is that they push employees to be their better selves. They're so brilliant. The employees say, I learned so much from working for this person. They're a complicated leader. So even in the media coverage of these startups, I think women are held to a certain standard where not only should they be ambitious, driven, visionaries, but also nurturing, compassionate, you know, someone you could go to to say, I have a health issue I need to deal with, and you could ask for time off or you could ask for financial support. And that's a lot, that's a really, that's a lot of expectations for a founder. So I think we have to let people learn and grow while also holding people accountable for bad behavior and bad management. Of course, there should be consequences. But if we say you get one shot at this and you better get it perfect on the first try, why would anyone start a company? We're gonna lose the next generation of founders if they don't, if they don't jump in the arena. I was raised to be an independent woman. Never depend on anyone. You go to school, you get a job, you make a career, and you get married, you have children. But you always stay independent. Never depend on anyone. Now I was leaving my job, and I was going to have to depend on my husband. And I questioned it every day, every day. I worked at L'Oreal for 17 years. My last role at the organization was an assistant vice president of HR. HR doesn't always have the best reputation. And my goal was always to change that perception of HR and be a trusted confidant and support system for employees who really wanted to grow their careers there. My husband is a correction officer and when the pandemic started, we made the decision that he was not going to come home until we figured out what the virus was because there is no such thing as social distancing in the jail. So I was alone. 
supporting my children. I had a child in pre-K and while it's pre-K, it sounds like it's not a big deal, but you want to prepare them for kindergarten and you want to teach them how to learn. So there was rigor in that. And then my son in first grade, it was a very important year for him. My child was a bit behind where he was supposed to be. So my fear was he will get left back. School is very, very important to me and my family. And the fact of getting left back meant I failed my son, and I couldn't imagine that. I also felt a lot of pressure from my job. While we didn't have the type of layoffs that many other companies were having, there were some. These types of conversations where I have to let people go, this was hands down the hardest time, and I took it very, very personal. I remember the day distinctly when I made the decision in my heart that I just, something had to give. That night I spoke to my husband and I said, I think I need to leave L'Oreal. When my husband and I talked about the decision of someone having to leave, it just was not a question of who that person would be. It was naturally that it would be me because of the role that I play in our family dynamic. We're going to turn now to the economic toll of the pandemic on women. The COVID recession is the first in which more women have lost jobs than men. 275,000 women left the workforce this past January compared to 71,000 men, according to the U.S. Labor Department. A new study by McKinsey and Company and LeanIn.org warns that the crisis could erase all the gains that women have made in recent years in the workplace. 2020 in particular has seen women being pushed back into these gender roles, right? And, and, and narratives around their um, home life, right? So picking up uh, a significant amount of the work with caregiving, child rearing, and housework, in addition to the work that they're doing um, in their professional lives, but being relegated back into the default caregiver status, right? Um, nurturing, uh, status also kind of reinforces those old traditional stereotypes that were already, um, you know, that women were already fighting against, right? In order to break into uh, the public sphere, in order to break into um, um, access to being in organizations and in these leadership roles. In a single year, we wiped out three to four decades worth of progress on women coming into the workforce, on being able to make a living for themselves and their families, on being able to realize a career and a dream. Um, and a lot of the reason is in this country we have no caregiving infrastructure, right? We have uniquely in the United States thought that caregiving was not a real job, it was just something for workers to have to figure out on their own, um, and everyone was left to their own devices. People have said to me, you're so lucky you get to leave. You have a husband who you know, supports you. But there is sacrifice. There's sacrifice in the sense that I'm, I'm not necessarily feeling the same fulfillment that I had before. There's a gap in my career right now. And will an organization understand why I made that decision? Many professional women had to make a decision between employment and caregiving and several chose caregiving. Supporting their re-entry into the workforce is going to be critical for us to retain, to, for us to gain the losses that we have sustained as women during this pandemic. And I think with that, we have to create the universal child care policies essential to support families. I think we also have to strengthen our networks as women to identify opportunities and support opportunities for re-entry. Before, when I was working in corporate, what motivated me was the title, Elevation. I wanted to make $250,000 base. That was my goal. And I left at, right at the cusp of it. And I walked away. And now that I've been out of the corporate world for almost nine months, 
my mind has completely shifted to what motivates me is not the money. It's the time that I now get to spend with the people that I love. When people would ask me, how are you guys doing during the pandemic? I literally would say, I feel like we're rich. We have a home, we have food on the table, and my family's healthy. That's all we need, honestly. I think our progress in terms of women and leadership is slow across all sectors, but trending in the right direction. The issue for me is how do we accelerate that change and how do we sustain that change? And it's no one answer. We've got to make sure that we have the policies that ensure that women can become unfettered from caregiving roles in society. I think equally important is that we need to have men, cisgendered men, who stand up and speak for gender equity and against gender discrimination, and who speak for gender inclusion. It is critically important for men to be at the table. Look, in a world in which 93, 94% of the Fortune 500 CEOs are men, we are not going to change the workplace if those men aren't at the table, aren't invested in it. So we critically need male leaders to step up and embrace these issues and lead from the top. I have been reminded that you take none of your gains for granted and that you have to protect your gains and then you have to keep advancing them. Hey, thanks for checking out CBS and Originals on YouTube. If you want to watch more documentaries, download the free CBS News app on your phone, tablet, smart TV, or any streaming device. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel by clicking down here. Thanks for watching.